what is life? What is non-life? What is the line between life and non-life? And maybe at any point we can pull in ideas of assembly theory. Mm -hmm. Like how do we start to try to define life? And for people uh, listening, so Sarah uh, identifies as a physicist and Lee identifies as a chemist. Of course, they are very interdisciplinary in nature in general, but um, so what is life? Sarah. <laughs> Yeah. I love asking that question because it's so absurdly big. I know. I love it. Um, it's my absolute favorite question in the whole universe. Um, so I think I have three ways of describing it right now. Um, and I like to say all three of them because people latch on to different facets of them. And so the whole idea of, of what Lee and I are trying to work on is not to try to define life, but to try to find a more fundamental theory that explains what the phenomena we call life. And then it should explain certain attributes. And you end up having a really different framing than way people usually talk. So the way I, I talk about it, three different ways. Um, life is how information structures matter across space and time. Um, life is... Uh, I don't know, this one's from you actually, simple machines constructing more complex machines. Um, and the other one is the physics of existence, so to speak, which is life is the mechanism the universe has to explore the space of what's possible. Um, that's my favorite. So can I, yeah, yeah, can I add on to that? Yes. Okay, can you say the yeah. physics one again? Uh, the oh, the, physics of existence. Yeah, the physics of existence. Yeah. I, I don't know what to call it. You know, like if you think of all the things that could exist, only certain things do exist. And I think life is basically the universe's mechanism of bringing things into physically existing in the in the moment now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what's what's another one? Yeah, we were debating this the other day. So if you think about a universe that has nothing in it, that's kind of hard to conceive of, right? Because and this is where the physicists really go wrong. They think of a universe with nothing in it. They can't. And you so think non-existence is really hard to think non of. Yeah. And then you think of a universe with everything in it. That's really hard. And and you just you just have this white blob, right? It's just everything. But the fact we have discrete stuff in the universe beyond, say, planets. So you've got stars, space, planet stuff, right? The boring stuff. But I would define life or say that life is where there are architectures, any architectures, and we should stop fixating on what the build is building the architectures to start with. And the fact that the universe has discrete things in it is completely mind blowing. If you think about it for one second, the fact there's any objects at all that, and the, there's because for me the the object is a proxy for a machine that built it, some information um, being moved around actuation sensing getting resource and building these objects so for me everyone's been obsessing about the machine but i'm like forget the machine let's see the objects the you know and i think in a way that assembly theory we realized maybe a few months ago that assembly theory actually does account for the soul in the objects not mystically like say sheldrake's morphic resonance or leibniz's mo uh, monodology seeing souls in things but when you see an object and I've said this before, but this object is evidence of thought. And then there's a lineage of those objects. So I think what is fascinating is that um, you put it much more elegantly, but but the barrier between life and non-life is accruing enough memories to then actuate. So, so what that means is there are contingency. There are things that happen in the universe get trapped. These memories then have a causal effect on the future. And then when you get those concentrated in a machine and you're actually able in real time, able to integrate r the past, the present with the future and do stuff, that's when you are most alive. Uh, you being the machine. Yes. Wait a minute. Why is the object? So one, one of the ways to define life uh, that Sarah said is simple machines creating complex machines. So... There's a million questions there. So how how the hell does a simple machine create a complex machine? By First mutation. So the, this is what we were talking about at the beginning. You have the minimum replicator, so a molecule. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was trying to convince Sarah of the mechanism get there years ago, I think. But then you've mm -hmm. been building on it and saying you have a small you have a molecule that can copy itself, but then that be a, has there has to be some variability, otherwise it's not going to get more functional. So you need to add bits on. So you have a minimum molecule that can copy itself. But then it can add bits on, and that can be copied as well. And those add-ons can give you additional function um, uh, 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 to be able to acquire more stuff to exist. 
So existence is weird, but the fact that there is existence is why there is life. And that's why I realized a few days ago that there must be, that's why alien life must be everywhere because there is existence. Is there like a conservation of cheeky stuff happening? So like, how can you keep injecting more complex things? Like, um, doesn't the machine that creates the object need to be as or more comp more powerful than the things it creates? So how can you get complexity from simplicity? So the way you get complexity from simplicity is that you, I would, this, I'm just making this up, but this is kind of my notion that you have a large volume of stuff. So you're able to get um, seeds, if you like, random cues from the environment. So you just use those objects to basically write on your tape, ones and zeros, whatever. And that is that is necessarily rich, complex, okay? It, but it has a low assemblyness. but even though it has a high assembly number, we can talk about that. But then when you start to then integrate that all into a smaller volume, as over time, and you become more autonomous, you then make the transition. I don't know what you think about that. I think the easiest way to think about it is actually, which I know is a concept you hate, but I also hate, which is entropy. But people are more familiar with entropy than what we talk about in assembly theory. Um, and also the idea that, like, say, physics as we know it um, involves objects that don't exist across time or, as Lee would say, low memory objects. Um, so one of the the key distinctions that that is, low memory objects, <laughs> yeah. So physics is all well, physicists are low, mem low memory low memory objects. Quick clip. But, the, uh, <laughs> physicists are creators of low memory objects or yep. manipulators of low memory objects. Yep, absolutely. It's a very nice way of putting it. Okay, sorry, go yeah, ahead. No, sorry. sorry to uh, keep no, interrupting. No, 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 it's fine. Um, I like it too. It's very funny. Um, but I, I think it's a good way of phrasing it because I, I think, you know, this kind of idea we have in assembly theory is that, um, you know, uh, physics as we know it has basically removed time as being a physical observable of an object. And the argument I would make is that when you look at things like water bottles or us, um, we're actually uh, things that exist that have a large extent in time. So we actually have a, a physical size in time. And we measure that with the, something called the assembly index um, uh, in molecules. 